continue, after which he did a postdoc at UC Berkeley. His research on robot learning has received the best paper award, some best paper awards at ICRA and RSS, and he has been featured in a number of uh, media outlets. So thank you so much, Lero, for joining us. We really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you so much for the really nice introduction. I'm really happy to be here in this beautiful, uh, beautiful city. Um, okay, so to get started, uh, I'll be talking about um, more of our lab's recent work in building home robots. Uh, so since a lot of this work is very recent, uh, feel free to ask questions. You know, uh, let's let's uh, let's keep it interactive. Okay, so to start, here is a video of something most of us can do quite easily: opening a soda can. So, as you can see over here, you you uh, go to the can, acquire. the can without spilling all the drink over this, right? So even though it looks like a very simple task, there's a lot of interesting uh, extrality involved in, in trying to solve this task. Uh, but what I think is even more interesting is our ability to interact with environments that are quite messy and quite, you know, environments that we have not really interacted um, with previously. So here's a video of like two kids who have been asked to clean up uh, their room um, and clearly they're not really good initially. They just play around, lie on the ground, you know, wallowing, but eventually they sort of uh, get their act together and clean up the place. And viewing this as a roboticist, it's like uh, sort of, you know, it's, it's cute, but it's also like uh, sad at the same time because we don't have any robots which can do anything close to what these two small kids are able to do over here. Okay, so as we sort of like, you know, as a roboticist struggling to even make a robot figure out how to pick and place objects, there's like a revolution happening in like other fields of AI, right? So if you look at um, NLP, for instance, we have like these amazing uh, chatbots where you can ask it questions um, about robotics and it gives you really good answers. And even apart from language, you have these amazing new um, video generation models where you can give it a text prompt, like create a realistic video of people relaxing at beach, then a shark comes out of the water and surprises everyone. And it can create videos of this sort. Okay, so it's uh, this, there's clearly some, some issues over here, but you can see that a lot of these um, video models are getting there, right? It's creating things which are feeling more and more um, realistic. Okay, so how do we create robot models which can which can sort of uh, output things which are as amazing as these um, language and um, and like uh, video generation models? So if I go into sort of our philosophy of how to create a robot model, I want to sort of break down how I see the, uh, the sort of current space of how people are trying to build um, a robot model. So the first sort of main school of thought is what is uh, what we can call the nativist school of thought, which is where we try to bake in as much information about the world as possible into the robot. So this information, it can be in the form of fiction models of how objects interact with other objects. It can be in the form of a collision model between how two objects hit each other. It can also be in the form of like, you know, looking at what's in your world, uh, creating good models of them and giving the robot already information about it, right? And of course, these type of models have been really helpful um, in robotics in the past. So for instance, if you have seen these amazing videos of Boston Dynamics um, robots um, doing a backflip, or if you have seen OpenAI hands solving a Rubik's Cube, this is all because of, uh, of the fact that we have good models of the world. But the problem over here is that in order to get any of these things to work, you need to first observe the world, right? You have to create a model of the world, put all the parameters inside a simulator, optimize things over there, and then transfer it into the real world, right? And then of course this doesn't work in the first try, so you have to keep going back and forth until you get something that actually works well. And so you'll see in, in a lot of these cases, a lot of these teams, they spend you know, like multiple years trying to actually make these things work. And at, at the end of the day, they have something which can you know, maybe solve a Rubik's Cube, but cannot do anything else really. Okay, so in sort of opposition to this school of thought, there's the other school of thought where instead of 
having humans go down and like write all the rules of the of the world, what you can do is you can actually learn from scratch, right? You can take lots of data, internet scale data, and train large internet scale models uh, on this data, right? And then you can actually try to deploy these models. If these models don't do as well, you, well, you get more data, and then you can keep improving, uh, improving these models. So this is exactly um, what we did, you know, when I started my PhD, which was like nine, ten years ago. Um, and what we did is we we took a robot, we asked the robot to sort of interact with objects on a table, and then from these interactions, learn how to grasp objects. And so we saw things like, okay, if you uh, you know, learn over like uh, half a month, you can now learn reasonable models to now grasp new objects you have not seen before. And then if you scale things up and you have many, uh, any more robots interacting with the world, well, you can get increased amounts of performance in these models. Okay, so what's the problem over here? Well, uh, a lot of the works you see are like 2015, 2016. And so the obvious question is, what about now? It's 2024, right? So where have these models uh, actually gone? What are new problems that these that these sort of models can actually do? And the answer is not as much, right? We haven't really progressed too much uh, uh, too much further from these type of grasping models. Okay, so so why is this the case? Well, I think there's like a fundamental limit to how much uh, how much of data we have in robotics, right? So here is a sort of fun plot from the scaling loss paper. Uh, on training LLMs from OpenAI. Uh, it's in 2020, but I think a lot of the lessons sort of still hold, where if you increase the data set size by orders of magnitude, so this is like exponential scale on the x-axis, you get a linear uh, loss reduction. So for, so for every order of magnitude increase, you get a linear, um, like li linearly your errors go down. And the sort of thing to note is that this sort of regime in which large models work is like in the order of trillions of tokens. Right? The problem in robotics is that the amount of data we have is so far is so far away from this that it, you know it requires a different scale altogether. Right. So of course you know there's some sort of hand waviness I'm doing over here because LLM training is like a fundamentally like supervised learning problem, whereas um, robotics has like you know maybe reinforcement learning and like uh, a decision making aspect there. But still, I think hopefully the, the sort of uh, the point where we are operating in a in a data regime which is very very far away from the data regime in language or in vision. Okay, so this is also clearly not going to scale. So how should we how should we do things? Okay, so uh, before I go over what what we're going to do, let's take a look at this fun video of a cat learning how to open a door. So when it starts off, it doesn't it's not able to open a door but it knows where the handle is, right? And then, you know, it keeps interacting with this handle along with some feedback from its uh, its sort of owner, right? And so, you know, from some feedback, it figures out how to do this. And now eventually after it's done this, it can now open open this door anytime it wants to. Then of course it gets some sort of pats on the head as, as a reward for doing a good job. Okay, so what's happening over here? So clearly we have data, right? This. This cat is clearly interacting with the world, is clearly able to obtain new data from the environment. It's clearly updating its model of the world. But crucially, there are there are sort of interesting aspects in how this data is created and how this learning is happening, right? So there is clearly a prior knowledge in this cat on how to interact with the world. And then it's being guided by human feedback. Okay, so we're, we're gonna call this type of an approach a constructivist uh, approach to building a robot model. And sort of more concretely, we're going to talk about three things over here. So the first thing is that we're always going to build on prior knowledge, right? So in the case of a robot, this type of prior knowledge can be in, in the form of a foundational model or a pre-trained model in either language or in vision, right? And we're going to sort of construct the robot's model and knowledge on top of this prior knowledge. The second thing is that most of this prior knowledge is not in the form of grounded robot information. It's in the form of internet data, right? So to actually do things in the real world, you actually need some data in the real world. So we need to have mechanisms where our robot can actually get more knowledge about the real world from human information, right? So you can ask human for feedback, human gives you feedback, you can actually learn from that. And third, you know, you may not have humans all the time. And so we want robots to sort of autonomously 
interact with the world, gain more information on its own, and keep adapting its knowledge and assimilating new knowledge into its model. Okay, so these three things are sort of the overall outline of what I'll be speaking today. You can sort of think about it as part one, part two, part three of this talk. Okay, any questions so far about what I've been talking about? Yeah. This at this moment, you said we might need a lot more data in order to get there at scale, but you know, there's a lot more data in an image than there is a text. Yeah. Do you think it, we need a similar amount of data or one order of magnitude less or more? Yeah, so so the question is, um, there's a lot more data in images and maybe a lot more data in sort of sequential images than just uh, in term, uh, just in text. I think there's few aspects of why is a lot of data important. So there's one just about scale, but I think more importantly, it's about the diversity of data. So if I, if I have uh, just images in one lab environment, right, that's not going to be as diverse. And so the features and representations you learn do not transfer well to like new environments. Now, of course, you can have images and robot data in many, many labs. But the question is, what's that scaling? Do you need 100 labs? Do you need 100 homes? Do you need 1,000? Do you need 100,000? So I think that sort of scaling is just unknown. No one has run an experiment where we have like a million homes of data and seen how, how, the, how the performance of a robot model improves when you go to those million homes, right? So I think there's a, just, just since we are in a different sort of problem, no one has investigated how the data scaling works over there. So exactly to your point, it could take one order of magnitude more data. It could take many orders of magnitude more data as well. Yeah. Yeah, again, this is sort of, I would say a little bit unknown because it, it depends upon the type of problem as well, right? So if you're doing just like offline learning, right? What happens in offline learning in a decision-making problem is when there's an error, error will keep controller and for that you do not need a lot of data so it really depends upon the type of problem over here i'm talking more about like sort of doing like imagine trying to do a task in your home that's a type of uh task we're trying to solve over here so imagine you have visual inputs and you want to output sort of motor commands of how the robot arms or the wheels of the base need to move in order to solve your task Yeah, great question. So the question is, uh, if we need data, why don't we just learn from lots of simulation? So I think this is already being done. There's a bunch of problems for which, you know, training something in simulation and transferring transferring the learned models from simulation to real world is the way to go. For example, things like um, locomotion, for instance, we are seeing a lot of progress in the sim to real uh, way of doing things. Um, the problem in simulation is that you have to build uh, environments and building environments which match the distribution of what robots are going to see in the real world is not an easy problem. So I think the, the hard part of sim to real is the real to sim part where you're observing the real world and sort of creating simulations of that, right? So if you had some way of generating a million homes in simulation where it has high fidelity and actually matches the real home, I think that would be the way to go. It's just really hard to do that. Okay, so with that, I'll move a little bit um, further from here and I'll take more questions later. Uh, okay, so the other sort of consideration in this talk at least is the type of environments. So we're gonna take seriously the idea that we want these robots to go into real world home-like environments. So we need our robots to learn from you know sensory information. Um, and so the sort of robot we use is this uh, is a robot called Hello Robot, it has wheels and it has an arm, it has a single arm on it. Um, but as we create algorithms for this home robot, we also want to make sure that the algorithms themselves 
uh, sort of translate to other problems which are not necessarily home robotics problems. So we will look at uh, like very briefly some problems in uh, enhance and dexterity where it's not necessarily in as uh, uh, as diverse environment as the one on the left, but it's it, it's it's trying to show that a lot of these algorithms can actually translate to non home problems as well. Okay, so let's say you know let's let's get started with the actual research now. So let's say we have you know, recently uh, just bought this robot. I put this robot in your home and I want this robot to start doing something interesting. So I give the robot a text um, a text command like, okay, robot, uh, take the Takis from the desk and place it on the nightstand. Okay, so from this image, are you able to see where the Takis are in the image? Yeah, you're able to see, okay, some, some, some are and some are not. Okay, so the key problem is when you bring a robot into in, in into any environment, it actually doesn't know what's where. Uh, and so the first step before we do anything is grad student uh, scanning. So we first try to get a scan of the home. And this basically just involves like, uh, you know, hopefully the, the homeowner or someone who takes their iPhone out and just like scans the room. So what's happening in the scanning process is that the robot is not starting off from blank. It doesn't have to solve the exploration problem. It already has a reasonable map of what the home looks like. Okay, so once we have the scan, what we're going to do is we're going to chain together a bunch of pre-trained models on top of the scan, right? And so the idea over here is we're not going to do any learning at all. We're just going to take pre-trained models that I can uh, download from the internet put in some sort of glue of how to fix these models together and see what's the best performance uh, it can actually get um, using these pre-trained models. Okay, so let's sort of follow through um, this exercise. So the, so the first thing we do is we need to know where things are in the world. So for this, we build something called uh, a semantic memory and the exact algorithm's name is called uh, Oxel map. So the way this works is, as, as this person was scanning the room, at each time step they, uh, from the phone, we get uh, an RGB image and a depth image, right? So this is just from the... From, uh, computer vision tools, what I can do is I can fuse this RGBD information into some sort of a point cloud, which looks like that um, at the bottom. And then what's sort of interesting, at least as um, you know, as a fundamental thing is that for each pixel, that is for each point in the image, we know what the X, Y, Z location of that point is with respect to some global frame, okay? So for each point over here, we know, we know like a X, Y, Z of that point. Okay, so this is, so the stream at the bottom is just classical, uh, computer vision. Now, the sort of more new school thing you can do is you can take those RGB images, feed it through a pre-trained uh, open vocabulary object detector and get locations of things inside the image. So just by feeding it through our AIT, it can say things like, oh, here is, here is a cabinet door. Here is a coffee maker. Here is uh, a small owl. Right. So all this information is already in the pre-trained model. And so we, we now have these boxes on things inside the image. Okay, so now from this box, what I can do is I can figure out what the clip embedding of those things inside, inside the box are. So the clip embedding is, is like a image representation, which, is, which has a mapping to a text, uh, a text representation. Okay, so once I have this clip embedding, I can now relate for each pixel that has been uh, sort of associated with some object. I can I can take the clip embedding and give it an assignment of the X Y Z position. Okay. So what's happening here is that for everything that has been seen in the scan, the representation of that thing is associated with the spatial location of that thing. Okay. So. Why is this important? Well, I'll show you how we can use this specific map representation and do some interesting um, robotics things on top of it. Okay, so here is sort of the scan of the room. It's, a, it's in, a, in like a point cloud form. And now let's say I want to find the plant. 
what you can do is you can give it the text query of plant, find the clip feature of it, and literally match that clip feature to all the things which were seen in the environment. And so from this, you know that the word plant is associated with this like green thing over there. Right. In the same way, you can give like other queries like orange laundry bag, you can give umbrella, and it can sort of find that the umbrella is on the bottom left and the orange laundry bag is on the right side. Okay. So now we have a way where if I give you a text query, you can associate that text query with something in the spatial world. Okay. Next question, why, why are we in a spatial world? Okay, so uh, I'll take a question in like one second. So because of being in a, in a spatial world, we can now do some, we can now just use standard robotics tools to make the robot navigate around inside an environment. So let's say I wanted to locate the R keys on the desk. I give it the, the text command of R keys on the desk. It finds the, the R keys over there. Now let's say my robot is starting at that X position. Now I can go to that dark keys on the desk by just doing A star. So I run A star in this environment, find the path, and it'll tell me the path to go to the dark keys. So here is the sort of rollout of the robot trying to go to the dark keys. And I'll take the question that you had there. Yeah. Yes. Uh, do, uh, do. Uh, it's just I see that um, when you recreated the environment, there was no reflection. But here, when it's acting, there is the reflection. Is the like I presume reflections is some kind of challenge for reconstructing the mapping. So reflections are important, but um, so when you when you take a scan, right? What happens is for the same thing, you get multiple views of it. So reflections sort of get adjusted in that way, and even for the for the um, aggregation of the clip representation, what we do is we, we do some sort of simple averaging of that representation. So in case you see a reflection of something somewhere, you will see reflections of many things in that same point. And then they will all just be averaged and hence you won't get a reliable retrieval from that point. So if you were searching for something like, I want to find a mirror, you may not find a mirror. But if you are trying to find something which you have seen through a mirror, it will not give you the mirror because you have seen many other things at the point of the mirror. That's my understanding, yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah, I'm wondering like how you decide what level of abstraction to feed the image to clip. Uh, so like what constitutes an object? Yeah, this is a great question. So, so there's a lot of moving parts over here, right? Like we could have used like, a detection model, we could have used a segmentation model, and then we could have different sort of abstractions of a detection model. Over here, we sort of like, through trial and error, we found the right sort of, uh, sort of scale at which the outputs are reliable, right? Um, and so since we know that our, at least through our experiments, we found that this OWL uh, AIT works reasonably well, and it's also sort of open knowledge, so you can give it any sort of arbitrary, uh, like uh, uh, a text command and it, and it'll work. So that's that's why we ended up with this. But if I'm doing this experiment now, maybe there's a more recent model that you would use instead. Yeah, okay. All right, so let me, okay. So we are here, we know how to go to a specific um, object in space. And now after our, after our robot goes there, it looks at the table. And from, from the head camera, it sees this image on the right. Now from this image, it needs to figure out how to grasp the, the, uh, the Takis from this desk, right? Okay, so what we do is we use a pre-trained grasping model called AnyGrasp. And what AnyGrasp does is, given an observation from this camera, it figures out all the ways to grasp things in there. But of course, this model doesn't know anything about objects, so it actually, proposes graphs on the edges of the point cloud, which, which clearly says that it doesn't know what an object is. Okay, so now to get graphs on the object called the Takis, we use a segmentation model to segment out the Takis. So this is a combination of um, segment anything along with a language, uh, a language model um, alongside it. 
So from this, we can say, what are the pixels in the image which have which are close to the word um, Takis? Okay. So then you simply find the intersection from the segmentation and the grasps, and now you know how to grasp the object called Takis. Okay, so here is um, uh, sort of the rollout of this. So it goes, lifts the arm up, goes to the grasp, it picks it up. And then after picking it up, it was asked to go to the nightstand. So again, it uses the voxel map to figure out where the nightstand is and then navigates all the way to the nightstand, which is on the sort of far left side of the image. Okay. Yeah. So, so the way any grasp works is it gives you a grasp with a grasp score. So, so each grasp has a score alongside it. So we take that score along with the intersection of the segmentation. There is also a heuristic as well, because so the, the any grasp model was trained on a parallel jaw gripper, whereas this gripper is not exactly a parallel jaw gripper. So, there is, so we do some, some sort of heuristic tuning to figure out what grasps actually work on our gripper. And so using all of this, we just choose the grasp with the highest score. And so there's only one grasp with the highest score. But you could do something like you try out the first grasp, it doesn't work, and then maybe you can now choose a different grasp. So something, there's like uh, a bunch of follow-up work, both from our group and some other groups, which are, which are looking at this thing of not just taking the best thing, but looking at um, other options as well. Okay, so now the, the last part is to drop this object um, on the nightstand. Again, over here, it's fairly straightforward. We take um, a segmentation model, we feed in the text query of nightstand, it segments out the pixels of the nightstand. And then here there's a simple heuristic of finding a flat surface. And we drop the object um, on that flat surface, which you'll see over here. Okay, so overall, what you have seen over here is that we have just, you know, in terms of running an evaluation, you just take this robot to a new house, drop it there, you give it a text query, and it should be able to do like a pick and drop um, execution. Right. So you can take the same robot, go to another house, say, okay, move the cooking oil bottle to marble surface, and it'll give you a behavior of this sort. And then again, uh, you can use it in many other environments. You can give it other sort of uh, sort of textual commands, and it should be able to solve it. Yeah. Do you update the voxel map when you move objects around? This is a great question. We do not. And so once it moves something, uh, it doesn't know that it has moved. And this is actually a very interesting thing which we are trying to solve. And it's surprisingly hard to solve it. Um, right, because when you have moved something, you need to somehow delete that information, mask it with like you know with with what information was there previously, and then update the new information. And then every time you solve a task, it's, it's not like you may only move that one object. You may have also bumped into um, some new object. So the right way of doing it is like you know you move you know you you solve your task and you go back you again rescan the scene update the map and you keep doing this. So we're we're trying to figure out good ways to sort of do this process in a dynamic way, but it's not it's not as easy as it seems. That's a great question. Yeah. What happens if you give it a task that it can't do, like uh, you say green gloves or something, and they're not there? Uh, will it try and pick up the most similar item? Or? Um, right now, if it doesn't find an object with some threshold of confidence, it will just not attempt it. But you can change that threshold of confidence in code. Yeah. Okay, so over here, I've shown you a, a bunch of successful examples. But at least like from our viewpoint, the most exciting thing about this project was all the ways in which it fails. trials of this method in a bunch of different uh, places including home environments um, and they were like there are there are many many 
failure modes uh as as you can see over here but i want to sort of talk about two of the most interesting modes of failure which we did not expect when we started the project so the first mode of failure is this thing we call vlm incantations so the way in which you give the text query really affects how the visual scene is understood right so for example uh, on the leftmost image if you give the query orange soda can you will not like the model will not be able to detect that can but if you give the query of metallic golden beverage can it will be able to detect it right now a more egregious example is the second one where if you give gray eyeglass box it can detect it but if you give gray eye space glass box it cannot detect it anymore okay. so so again uh you know just by seeing a lot of examples of these large uh, uh like vision language models we may assume that uh that these things actually work well but it actually doesn't work that well and many times you have to keep prompting the system many times to get the right sort of retrieval to get the right object you want uh, the other thing we tried more um more recently is we use these things like uh gpt4v along with some search on top of it and we saw sort of uh maybe not the same failure modes but similar sorts of failure modes even with more recent models okay so clearly a lot more work needs to be done in this space of um vlm training okay the next main uh mode of failures which we are super surprised by was that um uh, we thought that grasping models were good uh and they are you know reasonably good but there's still a lot of um weird sort of um failure modes in those models especially if you have objects which are like transparent like the ones on uh, on the left it's like uh, a half used dish soap and so half of it is transparent and it somehow outputs a grasp which is like very weirdly trying to grasp the the top of the of the dish soap because it thinks its hand can actually go through the object um and then there are a few more examples of failures where because the object is on the table you cannot go into the table to grasp it so the example of the banana uh the robot tries to tries to move its hand inside the table to grasp the banana okay so uh all of this code is 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 all online so if you have uh, a hello robot you can actually immediately run this on your hello robot and even if you don't have a hello robot a lot of the individual pieces can be used on other robots as uh, as well so all this work was led by uh, by um pechi uh, ahi and yashwant so uh, you know all the credit for this it goes to them uh, and again if you if you have an improvement to any of these models that you would like to add feel free to you know just add it um add a fork to it uh, or add a pull request and we'll be happy to sort of um integrate that okay any questions up to this point maybe i have one actually um how how do you feel about the hardware like i i mean at a higher level like do you feel that right now we have good enough hardware to solve home robots and we're only missing algorithms or are we missing sensors or yeah i think this is a great question so let me just move back over here so we actually have um robot like hardware failures as well in here but that's actually a very small fraction of the of the failure modes so i think so for example if you look at the number of navigation and manipulation failures so the hardware failures is just 28 among all the failures right so so you can still get away with a lot even with hardware which is not as great so that's fine i think the I, i think even with the hardware we have there's a lot that you can actually do yeah. okay so um over here so far we have a system where you can just plug and play use these uh arch models in arbitrary homes but on the downside this system can only do two tasks right it can basically only navigate to objects and then grasp and pick up objects that's the main thing it can do Okay so the next big question we're going to try to answer is how do you scale to beyond these sort of just two simple tasks okay so let's say you want to like open a drawer right 
So to do this, what we have created is this thing called the stick. Uh, so what the stick has is it's basically a reacher grabber. So you can uh, easily purchase it from Amazon for like $25. Uh, it's It gets observations using an iPhone. So if you have an iPhone in your pocket, you can just slide it on it. To slide it on, you need a, a phone stand, which, which takes uh, a couple of hours to be 3D printed. Okay, so from this, let's say you wanted to um, open a drawer, you sort of hit this, hit the record button and you show uh, a demonstration of, of how to um, open this drawer. And you give like around 24 demonstrations for the task. And then in around 20 minutes of training, it gives you a model. And now once you have a model, you can, you can actually run this model on the robot. So here's how that works. So on the robot side, again, uh, it you know it's 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 again using the same iPhone camera, so um, you can you can still take your own iPhone camera, attach it on the robot. To attach it, you need to have a phone stand. Phone stand printed here is slightly different from the phone stand on the stick because the robot's end effector is slightly different. Uh, and then our robot is the Hello Robot stretch, the same robot you have seen uh, in the previous work. Okay, so here is. Uh, a deployment now of this robot executing that policy to open this drawer. Okay, so now this robot learns how to how to open this drawer um, in your in your house. But you can you, you know you can you can take the stick again. And let's say you want to I don't know like open the blinds. You can give it a few demonstrations for that. It'll learn how to open the blinds. You can teach it to now close the drawers because you have opened them uh, and do sort of all, all other sorts of tasks um, in your home. You can also take this to your, you know, your, your friend's home, your neighbor's home and train like a bunch of um, robot policies for all of these tasks. Okay. So, yeah. I guess I was wondering in this case, like you've collected a lot of data. Mm -hmm. um, Maybe you've also got a robot that's got a particular morphology. So do you ever have demos that are collected by people that are challenging to map back to the robot model of all of those dynamics? Yeah, this is a very interesting question. So um, there are a few failure modes, but so on, on the robot side, the action space is like in six dimensional space, right? So it can, it can, you know, it can sort of reach all sorts of end effector locations. The problem is in foreshadowed planning by the human. So when the human is, is operating, the, the human is operating using their constraints of where they are standing, their constraints of where their arm is. While on the robot, the robot has its own constraints. Like maybe the robot is not able to read some things which are really high up. Maybe the robot cannot move its hand around an object. Because if you see this robot, this robot sort of is has like a telescopic joint. So it actually, it's not able to do something like this. But a human can do this, right? So you may see these types of gaps, but they only happen in very sort of specific, uh, like specific cases, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, all right. So overall, it, um, the same robot was taken to um, 10 homes all around. New York City, we train, you know, more than hundred tasks on it. And overall you get a fairly high success rate. Um, and all of this is trained in like within 20 minutes, you can sort of train, train a policy for, for one specific task. Okay. So there are sort of three main uh, ingredients to make this work as quickly. Uh, and I'll, uh, I'll go over all these three ingredients in a little bit more detail. The first one is before we go into any new home, there is a large pre-training data set, which we have collected. And so a lot of the visual representations have been pre-trained on this data set. Then of course, to sort of pre-train it, we use a specific sort of self-supervised learning objective. Um, and then when we do, when we actually run the deployment, there's a fast um, fine tuning system, which helps train this models uh, under 20 minutes. Okay, so in, uh, in terms of the large pre-training data set, we have a data set which is called Homes of New York. It's basically um, undergrads who take the stick and go to like a bunch of people's homes, including uh, including theirs, 
and have collected a bunch of data. So at the time of this paper, we had around uh, one and a half uh, million frames, uh, around uh, 13 hours of data. Now we have sort of around 2x um, of this data. And one of the really interesting things about having um, having data in people's homes is that you get to see things that are not in any data sets, like this cat staring at the undergrad um, who's collecting this data. Okay, so to get this data, we had to sort of incentivize the undergrad so they get like, you know, a, a credit point in their class. And so like a lot of the undergrads who collected data did so because, you know, they really wanted an extra credit point. So uh, the cat's questioning them you know, in, the, in the background. Okay, uh, now now after we have this data, uh, we we do this sort of SSL pre-training on it. Um, so in 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 uh, in this line of algorithms, what's happening is you take an image, you apply two transforms on the image. You can imagine some sort of uh, augmentation on the image, and then you force the representations of this uh, of the augmented versions to be similar, and the representations of two different images to be different. This is done through um, a contrastive loss. I won't uh, go into a lot of details here, but if you're familiar with like MoCo V2, that's what we use over here, MoCo V2 or V3. Uh, that's what's done over here. Okay, now to sort of, so uh, at this point we have a pre-trained visual representation. Now let's go over how we actually do the fine tuning of this model. Okay, so uh, again, as the broad setup, we have 24 demonstrations. It takes like around five minutes to actually collect that. And then within 15 minutes, we need to uh, fine tune it so that in total it takes um, 20 minutes to actually um, run the deployment. So from the phone, we get sort of two image streams, right? There's one which is an RGB stream and there's one which is a depth stream. Okay, so for the RGB stream, we can just use the pre-trained model. So that's, that's fairly straightforward. We use that pre-trained model and we just automatically have a representation. Now on the depth side, we haven't done any pre-training on the depth side. Um, and we do this, uh, like we haven't done this for like many reasons, but the most important reason is we do not have good tools to do pre-training on depth. So what we do is something which is the most simplest, almost like stupid thing uh, that you can do, which is we take the image and we do median filtering on it. So we are artificially reducing our resolution, our spatial resolution of the depth image. Okay, so why is this important and why does this help? It's because now when, like what we really care about here is when our end effector is making or breaking contact with an object. And this gets really highlighted by the depth which is in the center um, of, the, of the image. Okay, so we simply do a median filtering. We have a vectorized um, sort of information of that. And then you can, you can take both of these representations, uh, concatenate them, add a small two-layer um, MLP on top of it, which then outputs the full 6D motion or the full 6D action uh, that the robot end effector needs to take. And once we have this action, we ask the robot to, to actually apply the action. The robot just does inverse kinematics to figure out how its wheels and arm need to move in order to make that action possible. Yeah. So how do you get the labels for the actions from the gripper that you, I guess, had collected the data from? Yeah, great question. So um, on the gripper, right? So so on the stick, we have a phone. So as the phone's moving around, it has um, odometry inside it. So it itself is doing fusion and is, uh, is, is telling us how the camera is moving. So for the X, Y, Z and the rotational, um, movements we simply just use the output of the camera of the of the phone for the gripper opening and closing we have a small neural network which is telling us if the gripper is open or closed and that's been sort of pre-trained before the fact okay so so with this you know um we get an average success rate of around 80 percent across all of these tasks and homes all around um new york city um but again i think the most interesting thing in these models is trying to query and see where they actually fail. So here are a few sort of examples of how they fail that at least we, we did not expect initially. So here is the task of sort of opening uh, an air fryer. And what you'll see is in the demonstration time, 
you know, it does it quite well, but there's a reflective surface on the handle. So what happens is as, as the gripper goes and, and grabs the handle, you, in the image, you now get to see the human in the reflection. So in the reflection, you will, you will see the stick, right? So when you now run a policy on the robot, the robot goes, it grasps the handle, then it sees itself in the, in the image. And then it like stops it, uh, you know, it goes like, you know, out of distribution, right? So it stops over there and the task fails, right? So again, this is a, a, this is like, again, a problem where if you get the data from a human, there may be things in the visual observation itself, which may, which may not, which may, which you may not see when you have a robot. Right? Okay. So um, there was another question about the hardware of the robot. So here's another one example which uh, where the failure mode is because of the hardware. So if you ask the robot to sort of open a door where the handle is really high, uh, its center of mass is quite low and its weight is also you know, not that high. So what happens is since it's applying a lot of force on top, instead of opening the door, it actually tilts in front, right? So, so if the handle is too high, which is, the, which is um, our top row, uh, it actually tilts in front and then, you know, the safety features, uh, you know, are, are triggered and the robot stops, but it can apply a lot of force. So in, in the bottom row, we are opening a freezer. So freezer doors, you know, normally require a lot of force to open and it can actually open a freezer door. And that's because at least for this freezer door, it's quite low. So it's closer to its center of mass. Okay. So we actually, um, reported this issue to hello robot and, they had an amazing suggestion, which was to add more batteries on the base of the robot. So it has more mass at the, uh, at the bottom. Yeah. To yeah. To put, yeah. Yeah. We should. And we actually, we actually did purchase more batteries. Yeah. Uh, actually what we did is uh, the older batteries broke. And so we took the older ones out and just stuck them on top and put new ones um, underneath them. Yeah. Okay. So, so again, all of this code is all online. So if you either want to use our data or you want to use our pre-trained models, um, you know, feel free to uh, go online and use this. And again, all of this work was, um, it was led by Mahi and Anand. Okay. Any questions at this point? All right, so we are running out of time. So I'm going to quickly skip ahead a little bit, let's see if I can, oops, skip ahead. Okay, let's go here. Okay, so, um, okay, so all of the work so far has trained a passive model, right? You have a bunch of data, you train a model on the data, and then you run a deployment. The thing about training anything in a errors during, during the deployment time, you may think that the model is supposed to do something, you run the model, and then it can fail in like a catastrophic way, right? Uh, and so one of the things which we have been thinking a lot about is when the robot fails, are there ways in which we can train the model from those failures? So the key over here, or the sort of line we have been exploring quite a bit, is if we can use our visual representations as a way to get reward signals to adapt our policies. Okay, so how would this work? Let's say you had an expert behavior on the top, and let's say from a passive model trained on this expert behavior, it fails, like the example at the bottom. Okay, now what you can do is you can feed both of these um, videos into encoders, and these encoders will give you a trajectory of representations, right? So each point in the trajectory is for each image it's embedding. Now, from, uh, from these two, um, trajectories, what you can do is you can match them. You can use like some sort of optimal transport way of doing the match. And this match is telling you how close the agent's behavior or the robot's behavior is to the expert. Okay. You can use this matching score as a reward function and then use reinforcement learning to update the model. Okay. So in practice, to, in to increase this reward, what the robot is going to do is it's going to prioritize trajectories which look closer and closer to what the expert had shown. Okay, so there's a lot more details in terms of how this is trained, but you know, just moving ahead, um, what this algorithm can actually do for you is within a minute of human data, so there's one minute on top over there, 
you can you can train things like uh, you know flipping a cube on a on a dexterous hand, stealing a dollar bill from a table, uh, opening the lid of a bottle, and so on. So for all of this, okay, you need one um, you need one minute of human data and around twenty minutes of robot interacting, uh, you know, interacting and doing RL in the real world. You can take the same algorithm. You can also run it on our home robots to do things like opening drawers, switching off lights, all of this stuff, all, all of this um, sort of stuff over here. You can also uh, also run it on your industrial robots to do things like flipping a bagel, inserting keys inside locks, uh, and so on. Now, I think uh, the most interesting thing is you can actually take a minute of data for one sort of object and then in your RL time, change the object and now train this robot to do things like trying to pick up uh, like a boba stamp card, like the one on the top, right? Here's an example of uh, flipping the bagel. So we, you know, we start off with showing the robot how to flip uh, a bagel because, you know, we are in New York, but um, you can you can sort of train you know you can do this sort of uh, this fine tuning and now teach it how to flip like a croissant or a slice of bread and other things of that sort. Again, all of this code is also online, so if you want to try it out, feel free to use this. It was uh, all this work was um, was led by Siddhant and Joe. Okay, so with that, I think um our. Hello. Uh, so is this similar like high side experience relay replay? Uh not really. It's not really hindsight experience replay because what it's it's not learning a goal condition um model at all. So you can so all it's doing is given a demonstration, it's it's sort of it's guiding the RL process to be around that demonstration. So this is all in the imitation learning setup. But with but with very small amount of expert data. So imagine an expert shows you something. You are, you already have a good prior of um, of what to do, and now the RL part is just helping you around that region of that prior. Yeah. Thank you. Hi. Uh, thanks. Great stuff. Thanks. Um, I'm wondering about what are the uh, limitations here? Like, are there some limitations in terms of the types of tasks or um, like the variability in terms of the possible ways that you could achieve a task? Yeah. Here. So, um, okay. So this thing works when your prior policy is close to what your optimal policy should do. So if I run my prior policy with some amount of exploration, my assumption is that in some of these runs, within 10 minutes or so, I will get a success. Because if I do not get a success, there's nothing, there's no high rewards. All the rewards are low. Right. So it's it's operating under the assumption that within 10-ish minutes of doing exploration around that prior, it gets a success. Now this can fail if the strategy itself is different. So let's say the optimal strategy. So uh, this actually happened in the in the bagel flipping case. So so we also tried this with like um, with like a soft bread, like a naan or like uh, uh, you know so, something of that sort. And that's sort of floppy. So you cannot sort of you you cannot flip it in this. You you're not able to flip it in this way. You actually have to lift it up and then and then sort of. Turn it. It cannot learn that because with this strategy as a prior, it would need so much of exploration to hit that optimum. So, if you if you are in a domain where doing random samples around the prior gives you a success, this will work really well. It will latch onto that success and and move the policy there. If you are not in that domain, it's probably going to be maybe helping you slightly, but not uh, but not by a large amount. Interesting, maybe a follow-up. So uh, so 
between this work and the previous work, like imitation is really the like the the engine that's like the mechanism that's driving things. Although there's like RL fine tuning here. Yeah. So like particularly in the previous work, and I guess this is what almost what motivated this work, if I understand correctly, is like the open loop nature of the like the the standard like diversion that you get in behavior cloning. Yeah. Is going to be a problem. And so, but is it really completely solved here? This thing because. Yeah, so uh, okay. so in terms of the talk, all the works are actually in, um, it's like in reverse chronological order. So, so so we actually did this work before the last work, which then happened before the first work. But I, but like there have there have been many streams of work in our group, and this was in so the base algorithm uses one of our older supervised learning algorithms, and I think it's sort of like an evolving thing, right? Where the more prior data you have it's likely that when you sample from the prior, you're going to hit a success. So at least in this case, we were learning from only one demonstration. But now since we have so much so much of data in homes, if I learn a model on that data, now maybe my prior in a new home may give me more successes if I just roll out from those priors. Right. So, so, but does this method with optimal transport nets like a... Uh transfer easily to that setting? So we do not know yet because we haven't tried it out. The optimal transport part is only for the RL portion of things. So once we have, so it should work with any type of prior. So um, in this work, in fact, uh, we actually had two types of prior models. There was one which was like a neural network prior, and there was one which was just like a trajectory prior. So if you if I give you one demo, well, let me just replay that one demo and then apply some noise on it. So you can you, you can do that as well over here. So whichever way that you can obtain a prior, it should be compatible with it. We just haven't tried it with like a strong prior trained from lots of data. Amazing, thanks. Thanks. Okay, so now I'm gonna get to the question that I spend most of my so-called free time thinking about. Um, so you combined a lot of models together to be able to train some of these, especially the first thing that you talked about, which yeah. was the most recent thing. Yeah. So I'm kind of wondering about where the future is towards to go, whether or not we should be combining a lot of, you know, like pre-trained robotics models, or if we should be going more of the end-to-end -end approach that some other people are trying, right from like inputs to action outputs. Yeah. That the models in between. So I think right now we should be trying to combine as many things as possible, because there is no way to get lots of data until you actually deploy something in the world, right? And so to get that data, you, we, may start, we may want to start off with these modular approaches, get data so that we can then train end-to-end -end models, right? I think it, like if I had an infinite source of data, I would train an uh, I would train an end-to-end -end model, but I just don't have that infinite source of data. So I think the answer really depends on what what is going to work now versus what is going to work like you know uh, I don't know like five or ten years from now because if you see if you see the sort of okay robot work right the work we 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 started off with it's like a you know you give a text query let me just pull that up again um, so with with just a text query it's able to do all of this so one option of doing this was is the sort of like you know I don't know the RT style way of doing it where you have lots of demonstration data and you train on all of that. And then at the end of the day, that works in like two of the kitchens in the Google environment, right? But over here, you can sort of, by just stitching everything together, two, you know, two grad students are able to create a model which you can take the robot to like anyone's home and it gives you reasonably high uh, rates of success, right? So it's like, if you want something working right now, this seems to be the right way to go. And then when you have a lot of these robots in people's homes, you know, sure it fails all the time, but now you have all of this data. From that data, you can then bootstrap and train maybe like a big transformer model on 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 like all these executions. Yeah. I don't know if that answers your question exactly, but hopefully it's close by. Yeah, I get it. Thank you. Um Related to Glenn's question, I think. So in OK Robot, you have an explicit representation of space. Right? Mm -hmm. um, do you feel that robot policies in the future will also have like similar spatial representations or will 
will they just be like video policies where we feed like hours of video data and hope for the best? Yeah. So this is actually the question which I've been thinking a lot in my free time. And uh, I think the there's this notion with a lot of end-to-end -end models and just neural models in general, um, in 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 general, where the representations are very like flat and implicit uh, and sort of implicit. And I think what OK Robot is doing is the representation is not flat; it's spatial, and it's um, it's it's also grounded in like a geometric space, right? So what that means is now like once i have this representation i don't have to now train a navigation model on top of it i can just use hstar and just directly deploy hstar on it i could not have done that if my representation was like some intermediate feature of a neural network so i think there is like a pro and con of everything right there's like some flexibility which we are losing maybe the, the world is more than just like clip representation stuck on an object right but um but at least in the short term I think it allows you to, you know, just by just by constructing the memory in in the right way, it allows you to sort of use a lot of existing tools. So again, I think it's sort of related to that. Yeah. So I see the trajectory of like I guess these kind of um, household robots taking a similar path as um, autonomous driving kind of did where it started off with, you know, the stack-wise modular approach. Um, and over time, as, you know, it became more, I guess, commercially uh, interesting, <laughs> um, companies started investing in basically collecting data for end-to-end. -end. Like, you know, right now, Tesla and Figure are basically having creating, like, these teleop suits for humans, collecting a lot of data and trying mm -hmm. to do these kind of tasks end-to-end. Um, -end. Um, and, you know, this... So, like, I guess... Do you see like this kind of work um, essentially becoming irrelevant if that just takes off? Like, is there any value to doing this modular approach? Like you said, to collect maybe data for that, but isn't the best data to collect for those kind of robots than um, these kind of teleop suits and actual, like with the embodiment that you would be deploying? Yeah, uh, again, I think it's a great question. I think the place where end-to-end -end learning has maybe actually worked is probably like self-driving at Tesla, right? Um, and I think the, like, so so anything which has an end-to-end, -end, like any, any problem for which end-to-end -end has actually worked is problems where humans volunteer you data. You don't pay people for data, they just give you data, right? So for um, NLP, everyone who's using a phone, who chats some, you know, who types something on like Twitter, uh, or on Reddit is like uploading data to like a big transform model to learn. You know, everyone who's like uploading like an image on like Instagram or something is like using, you know, there's like a large model, which is, which is like training on it. So to get scale, you somehow need like a process, like a societal process of people or like a societal process for like data to be uploaded at a massive scale. I do not think that you can, or like any group can, pay people to collect enough data to train one large model on everything. So, so I, I think the, the sort of more organic way of trying to get data where something is already useful. So let's say I make a robot, which is useful to you. You take it to your place. And now maybe if you want to add a new skill, you may want to give it some more data. Now this process, if it happens in like millions of households, you will now get data in that scaling order. Right? So, so I think, the like I, like I like to think of ways in which you can get some sort of like a societal effect where you know people want to give you data because they want their robots to do better. I think that sort of that sort of a of a framework, at least to me, uh, I feel like it's going to scale better in in, in the future. I agree, but uh, as to your point about Tesla doing this with driving, uh, so they do claim that you know, um, or like the public perception is that they use a lot of the driver data you know, that, you know, of the Tesla cars that have rolled out, but um, actually they don't. They, the for training their autopilot, they only use um, drivers that they pay in-house. Um, mm -hmm. And it seems like it's actually good enough. So, you know, same thing for their humanoid as well. Obviously it is better if you can get data from, you know, the public as well, but 
yeah, just that case alone. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's always hard to say what data is exactly being used and not used, but I think it's um, it's it's interesting, right? I think the the case in point for um, for it for at least um, sort of hands and a manipulation sort of setting is we still don't have a good model for actually grasping objects. And that's a problem for which there's clear financial incentives for, right? Like there's like so many companies which need to figure out how to grasp objects and do it really quickly. And if we still haven't gotten good learning models for that, uh, I'm not sure how you can, you know, how, how that mode of doing things will transfer um, when you have to solve harder tasks. Right. So again, I think when something is not working, you have to try many ways of solving it. And then when something works, then we all latch onto it. But if everyone's doing the same thing, then uh, we'll never know what, you know, what could have worked. Um, hi, yeah, thanks for the presentation. Um, I just had a question about one of the modes of failure that you mentioned for, I think it was the OK Robot. Um, so you said it was called like VLM incantations where your VLM was sensitive to the text query that you gave it. Yeah. And you would just have to kind of keep prompting it until you could get the prompt that would give you what you wanted mm -hmm. um, or that it was able to translate to visually. So I'm just curious if uh, you're looking into any other ways to mitigate that text query translation to visual in a more robust way. Yeah, this is a good question. Um, so so actually the the way to get the best text queries is to take the image that you want, feed it into GPT-4V and then ask it for what that object is, right? So it's like these large language models have the sort of same text outputs, like which also work as inputs. So, so if you if you use a AI model, it actually gives you data which is closer than if you asked an average human. And I think this is this has to do with the sort of priors of the data set, which a lot of these models are trained on. Like if you train both uh, GPT-4V and like um, OWL uh, or like a clip model on like clip data, right? Like um, lie on data, right? They will all have the same sort of text to image priors in them. And so, you know, the, the easiest way we have seen is, so what we're trying to do is we're trying to go from text to image. There are models which have been trained from image to text and so we just use the models going, going from image to text to get the text to go from text to image, right? Okay. So that's the fastest way. Now, I think that's not scalable because you don't want a human for every object to like mm -hmm. click an image and then give that text query, right? What, what, what I think will work is something like an interactive system where the robot, you know, based on a text query outputs the top five or six examples and asks the human, hey, is it like uh, this object or that object? And then maybe through interactions with you, it will like adapt with it. But I think there's another interesting point where the language that you use is different from the language I use, which is different from the language that um, that Glenn might use, right? So I think a lot of these models have to understand that language is not like a single thing. Everyone uses it in a different way. Uh, and that can only happen through interaction. So that's again, something which we are sort of interested in and trying to think about. Um, so hopefully in the future, you know, after a few interactions with you, it will be able to answer your questions slightly better than anyone else's questions. Thanks. Uh, sorry. So uh, for your robot, uh, do they recover from a failed attempt? Yeah, great question. So it depends upon which uh, which work you're talking about. With the OK Robot work, this one over here, it does not. So if it fails, it just fails. It has no no recovery in it. And um, a cop-out answer to why it doesn't have a recovery is because we're just using pre-trained models, and these pre-trained models do not have recovery modes in them. So these are some things which you have to train, right? You have to tell, you have to train the robot to do recovery. You have to train the robot that, okay, if this mode doesn't work, how to choose other modes? It's not, it's not inherent inside these models to do, to do this type of recovery behavior. Yeah. Uh, but in that case, you will need, uh, I don't know, a dynamic view of the world, right? I don't think dynamic view is as important as just taking in observations on the fly. 
right? Because the robot is always moving around. Robot is always seeing new things. Right now, we are just we just take images. Like if I have to grab an object, I only take the image when I have to grab an object. But when we are when you know, especially when like humans do it, right? As you're doing something, you're always observing the world, and there's sort of almost like a parallel process going on in updating your world around you. And that is something which is missing over here. Everything over here is in very like serial process. And I think what we need is some sort of like a parallel process, which is always updating the world, no matter what happens. Because okay, some mistakes may happen because let's say the robot was trying to do something and it it like it like hit something and something fell down. But also maybe it, as it was doing something, maybe uh, another robot came into the scene and did something else or a human came into the scene and dropped something somewhere, right? So you, I, I think you need to have a mechanism where like this robot is on the fly, always adapting its map of the world. Uh, I'm not sure how to do it exactly, but we'll need something of this sort. Uh, but in that case, so for every pay of parallel, we need uh, another free, free trade model to solve, to handle the, the case. Um, I don't think we need to have a pre-trained model for everything. Uh, or I don't think you need to have different pre-trained models for different things. I think you can, you know, for example, recovering from at least the failure modes over here. I think I think a lot of them can be assimilated into single models. Yeah. Thank you. I think that's questions for pretty much everybody. We can thank Laurel again. Thanks. All right, and we can probably...